I think in your marketing communications and your sales efforts, if you can present things in a logical manner, where you get agreement all the way down that path, by the time you get to the close, there's no pressure. It's understood. It becomes a formality. Hello, Architect Nation. Welcome back. My name is Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover how to run an architectural practice that makes you wealthy. This is the place where you can come to push against the brainwashed masses of architects who believe that it isn't possible to do good design and become wealthy as well through your work. Today, I have the opportunity to interview Mr. Brian Miller, who is the Senior Vice President over at RCAT, one of our title sponsors. So RCAT is an online catalog and directory of building specifications of CAD and Revit files that you can use in your projects. They've been around for a long time and they're leading the innovation in the terms of the digital and digitization of specifications and building product information for the digital age. Now in today's interview, I'm really excited to talk to Brian because Brian heads up the marketing and sales channels of RCAT as a senior vice president. So in today's interview, we talk about something that us architects generally aren't very good at and generally don't talk about a lot, which is sales and marketing. Now in smart practice, if you're one of our illustrious firm owners who actually works with us through our smart practice program, you know that stage number one to becoming the free architect is becoming a rainmaker. And being a rainmaker is made up of two very specific skill sets. Number one, being a marketer, and number two, being a closer. And so today we talk about these two particular attributes and skill sets. As well, Brian also shares with us some of the key principles that he's found as a professional who focuses on business development and creating relationships. He talks about some of the guiding principles that he's used to be successful and that he's seen to be successful in his career in marketing and sales over the past 20 plus years. So with that, welcome to today's interview. And today we're going to be speaking again with Brian Miller, Senior Vice President at RCAT. Hello, Brian, and welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thanks, Enoch. It's good to be here. Now, RCAT has been serving the architecture industry for quite a while now. Can you give our listeners who may not be familiar with it an overview of what is RCAT? RCAT is short for the Architects Directory. Um, it was founded in 1991 by Rick Janot, who had been an executive with McGraw-Hill Construction Information Group. Um, prior to that, he ran Dodge and Suites and Arc Record and ENR and a whole bunch of things that are quite familiar to the design community. It started off as a print directory. Um, the idea was to take product information from a central library back in the days of print and put it onto the desktop. And then in 1995, RCAT created the first website of its kind, and uh, we've pretty much been uh, pioneers in the space ever since. Uh, first library of uh, proprietary guide specifications. Actually, that was on a CD-ROM that came out the year before, 95. Uh, but ultimately, what we do is we pull content forward. Um, most decisions in this industry are informed decisions, and so we'll take the most important information that's on manufacturers websites and pull that forward to make it more accessible and then we index almost 600 manufacturer websites by making all those products immediately accessible through simple searches and then you click onto those products and it'll take you to those locations within those manufacturers websites uh, beyond that we have a library of cad and bim and uh, like i mentioned proprietary uh, specs uh, as well as spec wizard tools that automate the spec editing process Right now, we know that in that pulling off an architect any architectural project, a building particularly, there are a lot of specifications. There's so many different building products that go into a building. What what kind of technological advances? What changes have you seen in the way things are specified, in the way they're included in architectural drawings over the past decade or so? <laughs> well, going back to the early days, right before the days of uh, electronic media, uh, when people talk about cutting and pasting, you'd go into the plan room and find a project manual, and you'd actually see the Xerox traces of scotch tape, where paragraphs were literally taped into place. Um, technology's changed in so many ways and affected the, you know, I mean, today we um, have moved into Revit and BIM, you know, modeling and that sort of thing. Um, 
the spec side, it, it's changed in that everything is much more immediately accessible and it's a lot easier to keep everything up to date. Um, Arquette has 16 account representatives that work very closely with our, our manufacturing clients to make sure that the content on the site is curated and um, up to date. Sometimes manufacturers want to pull product. Um, sometimes they want to promote new product. Uh, that's one of the things that kind of sets us apart in the space and that we have these individuals that work with the clients so closely. But um, you know, there's all kinds of changes. Where would one begin? Mm. Tell me about building. What are you seeing in the in the in the area of building products themselves? Any particular trends or advances in the way that things are being manufactured or the way they're being specified in buildings? Well, so much of it. I mean, there's always in in manufacturing. There's always been a desire to be more efficient uh, because that produces profits. Um, but the sustainability. Um, impact of building products and how things are constructed has really taken over the space. I remember many, many years ago, I think it was the first green build show in Toronto, uh, AIA had uh, looked to reduce carbon footprints by like 50% in the next five years. And it was quite a dramatic goal. And of course, now there's uh, net zero and, and there's they're even going beyond that. Um, manufacturers to be green uh, early on were like, hey, we have recycled metal, right? Or we're green too. Um, and a lot of greenwashing that was happening. But even products that aren't necessarily um, organic and, and 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 natural that would typically be green, uh, manufacturers can go to market by the way they produce a product. Or like, the, for instance, there's a company that makes vinyl wall coverings in Louisville that has a whole business that recycles previous content, uh, you know, that of that material. And so there's a, a great desire to go green, uh, which is huge. It's one of my, my, you know, fun things about the business. Um, and beyond that, um, I, I think it's cool what's happened within the architectural community. Um, you know, I go back to the ADA years. Uh, it's hard to imagine a country or, or a place where you don't have ramps. Um, I had a cousin who was paralyzed from the chest down, and it was amazing how he could hop up with his wheelchair, hop on the you know six, seven, eight inch curbs. Um, and then we saw sustainability, and now we're seeing building health, we're seeing social justice, we're seeing you know so many things are influenced by the built environment. Um, when when young architects come to our booth at the AI show, it's kind of exciting to engage with them and talk about uh, how much influence they have as architects to affect everyone's lives. So I don't know. Mm. Indeed, it's it's very impactful. Let's talk about your what, what's your job role at. At RCAT, what, tell me about the day to day, what you do for RCAT, Brian. Um, well, I was promoted to senior VP a year ago. It happened to be Congratulations. two days before my 60th birthday, and I accused Casey of, like, you know, why does it have to be seniors? It's like senior rep, you know, I fit a certain age, and now I'm a senior. Um, I guess I was touchy at the time, but um, no, in this role, I manage the marketing and sales of RCAT. Um, I get involved in product development. Um, a few years ago when I was, or a couple of years ago when I was promoted to VP of Marketing, it was the first time in our history that we actively engaged with the people who used the site. Uh, prior to that, we'd been a really good website with sort of a sales arm. Um, through this, I get to speak at national conferences like CSI and SKIP. Uh, I get to talk to local CSI chapters. I'm going to do more with AIA in the next year. Um, but it really gives us kind of a the kind of insight and user feedback that helps us develop a product, and it helps me get a better feel for how we are accepted in the marketplace. You know, if my wife and I go to a cocktail party and somebody asks me what I do, I have a five-minute answer, and my wife shudders, and nobody understands what RCAT is, right, if you're outside of construction. But when I speak to local CSI chapters or I address, uh, say, Entre Architect uh, and what they do, um, Mark had a, their first in-person conference last year in Austin. And, you know, when you hand out your business card, and not only does everybody know who you are and what you do, uh, but they appreciate what you do and how you do it. 
we're free. We don't require registration. Uh, we don't dox people. We don't share contact information unless it's actually a request for information. So anyway, there's a, there's a, a really cool acceptance in the industry. I think my role is pretty much to serve as that bridge of understanding uh, to make sure that the manufacturers who promote their products on the site understand that. Beautiful. Brian, what we do is we help small architectural practice owners build a practice that helps them get more freedom, flexibility, financial reward, less overwhelm, more life balance through our smart practice method. And as part of that, one of the key things that architects need to be able to master is being a rainmaker. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes taking their business development into their own hands. So marketing is a big conversation. And I'd like to talk to you because a lot of our listeners do run practices. I'd like to ask you about your perspective on marketing. For you, when you say marketing, what is marketing for you as a marketing professional? I, you know, I was a marketing major and I ended up in sales. And um, to me, I think I succeeded in sales by applying marketing principles. I look at marketing as kind of the science of making it easier to buy, uh, looking at things from the perspective of the buyer, um, and then changing how uh, either the product is designed or how it is positioned, um, and and better, you know, being able to sell it based upon that. You know, what is the buying experience? Um, and so even in a, in a direct sales situation, uh, the best salespeople ask a lot of questions. And so they get a better feel for um, how the product might be positioned. And so they can direct the conversation in that way. Uh, I think the same is true for marketing. Brian, I know you've studied a lot of marketing books, sales books, leadership books, kind of currently, and it's probably hard to pick some favorites, but what would you say would be uh, some of the top books in this area that you're reading now or that you've read in the past? Um, Guy Kawasaki has some really good books. Uh, years ago, I read one on, it wasn't called Guerrilla Marketing, but it was, um, you know, kind of marketing on the cheap, you know, how to find uh, people that have a genuine interest in your product and, and have missionaries in, in the space. Right? You convince one specifier to use the product if they have a lot of influence, perhaps you're, you're, you know, it's marketing on the cheap kind of stuff. He had a book out not too long ago called um, Enchantment. And it's about uh, kind of creating the magic around the product and um, making the brand special. Um, there's a, an old book, 22 Irre Irrefutable Laws of Marketing or something. Um, you know, mo most of these books are marketing or sales oriented. I think there's a, a big connection between the two disciplines. Um, you know, like I said before, marketing is kind of the science of selling. So uh, the better you understand the process, uh, the more likely it is you're going to come up with a big idea for doing it. What's your opinion? If you wanted to sell someone an idea on a project or anything, what would be like the top three principles, the top three guiding principles in your experience for creating demand? I think in any engagement, and, and even when it's not, you know, person to person when it's company to company, um, one of the first elements is kind of, I don't know, almost removing yourself from that sales, buying, you know, purchase dynamic. Because uh, I think uh, buyers are typically um, have a defense up. Nobody wants to be sold. And so the first thing that has to happen is you have to kind of cross that and, and um, cross that threshold and establish trust. And, um, in, in an age of Zoom meetings, uh, sometimes that is more difficult than it might be face to face. And so oftentimes, I know when I meet with our clients or I meet with architects online, one of the elements of, of my uh, engagement is to use humor, uh, not like tell jokes, but to kind of be natural and authentic and, and uh, uh, occasionally clumsy. Um, but, you know, I, I think once the guard has been let down, it's easier to apply logic. Um, there was a fellow with sweets a long, long time ago. I think his name was George Davidson. And he said that sales is kind of creating this logical path to an irrefutable conclusion. I've never been a hard closer. And so I think in your marketing communications and your sales efforts, if you can present things in a logical manner, or you get agreement all the way down that path, by the time you get to the close, there's no pressure. It's understood. It becomes a formality. Um, and, and we use that quite a bit here at, at RCAD. Mm, it's like making yeah. a case in front of a jury. You make mm. a statement, the bolder the statement, the more you need evidence to back it up. 
um, but ultimately you're you're kind of creating a, a meeting of the minds. So the first element is kind of breaking through that situation, and it's not a presentation and somebody listening to a presentation. It's more of a conversation. Um, uh, Rick Janot used to say, "These aren't appointments; these are business meetings." Right? This is, you know, this is what we do. This is what you do, and let's see if there's any sort of connection there. Beautiful. Um, in your career, have you ever done any any belly to belly, door to door sales in the past? <laughs> Yeah, I guess. I never thought of it as belly to belly. Um, but uh, when I started out uh, after school, um, I had a marketing job and then uh, with Monarch Marketing south of Dayton and they had a layoff. And so I didn't have the job and I pumped gas for about six months and then I worked with Xerox. And Xerox had incredible sales training and they gave me a territory of the west side of Dayton. And um, there was a bit of door knocking. Uh, I've always been one to kind of find the easy way. Um, I read a quote one time, if you want, if you have something that's challenging, give it to somebody uh, who's lazy because they'll find an easy way to do it. Um, I wasn't necessarily lazy, but uh, in those days, in you know, the mid-1980s, um, no one was uh, um, pursuing that part of Dayton. It had been kind of neglected. And so I was welcome wherever I went. And they had a lot of old Xerox machines that cost a lot to maintain. And so I basically, over two years, replaced every unit on the west side of Dayton, and that ended up getting me the job at Suites. So, um, mm. yeah, there, there's a bit of that you know, door-to-door knocking on doors. Um, you know, back then, people bought copiers and memory writers and, you know, printers and things from business, you know, salespeople, you know, and, and not at your local office supply place. Yeah, was it? Are you an extroverted person? Were you like making those kind of cold calls, or or not? I don't know. I I like I like people once I have met them. Um, in terms of you know, I'm a little shy. I think um, I'm never one to kind of want to be the center of attention. I'm not, I'm okay at, at the podium, I suppose. Um, and and when I go to reunions, people uh, were surprised I ended up in sales. But um, I don't know. I like people. I think you know on the best days when you when you're driving home from a meeting or whatever, um, you kind of pinch yourself. I can't believe I'm getting paid for this because, mm -hmm. especially in the RCAT case, I mean we have clients that go back 30 years, and and so uh, once they come on board, they tend to stay on board. And if you do the job of account servicing, um, you you end up making friends. Um, mm -hmm. It was so cool when I came back to RCAT. There were I bet there were 150 people I hadn't talked to in a long time that were happy for me. And uh, um, and all that comes from that, that personal engagement we have with the clients. Um, one of the most attractive things about working with RCAT is a lot of companies have changed their business model. And they sell either just through online subscriptions uh, where there's no personal interaction uh, or through telemarketing outfits and that sort of thing. We still have kind of, uh, some people call it old school, but I think, like I said earlier, we need that engagement to make sure the content is up to date and it makes the site more viable. You remind me of something my grandfather told me few maybe a year before he passed away he was a very successful person and like you he he really liked people but i asked him about some of the kind of words of wisdom about success how he'd able to have the success he'd had in his career and uh and it's interesting he came down and basically said i just like people i've just always <laughs> liked people <laughs> so i work well yeah. with them because i like them i enjoy being around them and people see that why why do you like people brian i mean let's face it people can be temperamental they can be judgmental they can be critical they can be all sorts of things i i don't know i mean i ever since i was a little kid um our, our oldest son nick it was kind of funny he used to like to uh have trees and, and me kiss right so he'd like Ooh, and we'd kiss and he'd get all excited um mm -hmm. and he was always a big hugger um i the cool thing about being in sales is you, is you meet all sorts of different types of people. And the most challenging people are often not quite as challenging when you get to know them. You know, sometimes I think people purposefully have a crusty exterior because uh, within perhaps they're, they're, they, you know, for whatever reason, right, they create this, this persona. And once you break through that, um, 
you, you're fine. Um, in fact, it was interesting. My first two sales calls at Sweets um, called on a fellow named Wilbur Bybee in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, or somewhere down in the Indiana Limestone Valley. And uh, Sweets was dominant in those days. They People were just that you did binders and you did Sweets. And so I had been selling a very um, uh, competitive, I was, I had been selling Xerox copiers in a very competitive marketplace. And so when I came to Sweets, we had a monopoly. And so my first sales call resulted in going out to some local diner and having liver and onions, going back to his place. He said, uh, you know, my, uh, uh, somebody told me a long time ago, I needed a, an accountant, a good lawyer, and I needed to be in Sweets. And so he signed a contract. And I was like, wow, what a great job. This is incredible. Well, the very next person I called on, um, and I, he could potentially listen to this, so I won't give his name, but he's a very dear man. Uh, he was with Von Duren. And I go up there, and I was told, I didn't know anything about the construction industry. I was told, just go out with the renewal agreements. We had an 8.5% rate increase that year. Ask them to sign, and if they don't sign, ask them why. And so I present the contract. I'm nervous because there's all this dead space. This guy was really, uh, you had to poke him with a stick to get him to talk. And... <laughs> But like I said, he's a very dear man, as I got to tell. And at the end of the meeting, I said, well, here's here's the renewal agreement and you know, la, 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 la. And I said, well, you know, you want to sign it? He says, no. And I said, well, why not? He says, because I don't want to. <laughs> and I didn't know how to take it. Well, 25 years later, he's he's semi-retired. And it was the last day of our sales cycle. And uh, he was uh, with a legion at this point. And a lot of times companies don't realize that the deadline is actually a deadline because there's a lot of people out there that have flexible deadlines. They make up their own deadlines or whatever. Our cat's deadlines are really solid. And I knew there was no exceptions and there was nothing I could do if they missed this deadline. And they'd already said yes 20 times in, in that month. Well, Pat was on vacation and went into the office and got the thing signed. So the same guy that, and, and, and it was a huge, it was, a, you know, in terms of RCAT uh, types of projects, it was huge. I think we had like seven divisions that came in from that one agreement. Uh, but anyway, getting back to the question, I like people. I, I like the challenge of, of uh, convincing people of things. Um, my favorite calls are the ones where, you know, we call them red flags, where um, they've said no a dozen times. And somehow you can break through that and, and give them a better understanding. Um, I've told our salespeople, we don't really face objections because I think the truth of the marketplace is on our side. It's really a matter of understanding what their concerns are and then clarifying. And it's amazing. You can see the lights go off uh, even during Zoom calls. But um, in any event, you know, there are people that I've been friends with um, for for decades based upon these, you know, little meetings and, and the relationships that evolved after that. And that's where, you you know, it's kind of like baseball players winning championships and, and then realizing they're getting paid for what they do. Um, the, the pay has always been a kind of a secondary bonus. When people do tell you no, so in these some of these conversations where they, you've been told no multiple times, how do you approach that? All right, you know, I think, I don't think I could have sold most any product. Um, certainly couldn't have been in a marketplace where you sell a hit and run product where you, where you don't have that relationship piece of it. Um, and I could never sell something I didn't believe in, but when you believe in something and you know that you're right, no, doesn't really affect you because you know that they just don't understand. Um, I mean, I guess if you're looking at it from the outside, you're thinking Brian's a pretty obnoxious guy. He doesn't know when to accept no. Um, but the reality is I, I am right in these circumstances uh, for the most part. I mean, if a company makes a product that isn't specified nationally, um, uh, you know, then I wouldn't pursue those opportunities. Um, if there's a company that makes a product that isn't specified, it'd be silly to talk to them because even if they came on board, they'd end up dropping out. Um, I don't know. I, I think it, a lot of it has to, the resilience comes from two things. It's knowing that you're right. And, and it, it's not just that it's right for our cat, but it's right for the client. Um, 
And then the second thing is I like to win, you know, um, it's fun to, to woo people into your way of thinking. Mm. And how do you deal with defeat? Because when you, you know, winning's on the, on the other side of losing, what's your story or your narrative around losing? Sometimes that can hold us back because let's face it, we all like winning, but who really likes losing? Yeah. Nobody likes losing. Um, I don't know, you know, uh, the Cincinnati Bengals tend to get off to bad starts every year. And uh, Coach Taylor was interviewed after the, one of the games, and he said, you know, these three losses have taught us so much, and, and we'll use this information to win. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll be better for it. Um, I uh, tend to journal sometimes. Um, I don't journal all the time. I wish I did. I tend to journal when I'm kicking rocks or when I've suffered defeat or when I'm feeling blue. Um, I have this fear that someday the kids are going to find a big cardboard box full of all the dad's notebooks. And they're going to, all they're going to see are these like, oh, you know, these plans and, and getting out of the rut, you know, um, thinking that I've always been in the rut. It hasn't been the case, but um, the journaling kind of helps. Um, yeah, I, everything is like a temporary setback, you know, I, 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 and, and maybe I'm blessed in that way because uh, I know some setbacks in life are much harder than others. But, you know, I, if you just step back from it and regroup and plan it and come at it from a different direction or vow to do better next time, what have I learned? Um, that, that helps you, you know, get a positive out of the negative. Beautiful. Such important lessons. Brian, all of these can be applied to our listeners who run architectural practices. I mean, you know, looking at failure or losses as temporary setbacks, having certainty in the value of what you provide and, and using that in the face of setbacks and those, uh, you know, really engaging with and understanding where your clients are coming from. Now, for our listeners who, who you know, do architecture and one of they would love a resource like RCAT. If they don't know, if they don't know what it is or where to find it, where do they go to find out more about RCAT, what your company does? RCAT is uh, www.arcat.com. Um, we've just revamped the website. Uh, like I said before, it's free. There's no registration. Um, there are over a thousand manufacturers' proprietary guide specifications. So if, if architects are looking to create, uh, you know, if there's a brand that they prefer for a particular product within a commercial co uh, project, um, they're going to find proprietary specs. The specs that are on the site are not overly proprietary to the point where they're not useful. Um, the specs are written either by Mark Kalin, who teaches at Harvard, who's been president of SCIP and CSI. I think he was on the original Green Build Council. Um, the um, other fella is Ken Chappelle, who used to run master spec and spec link spec operations. And so everything is of high quality, and um, you don't have to worry about getting spam emails and, and unsolicited phone calls for accessing the information. Um, there was a, I was at AIA in Chicago a couple of years ago, and a young woman came up to the booth. The, the, the younger architects really love what we do. And uh, anyway, I was showing her the site and showing how Spec Wizard works. And she asked me how much it costs and how does she register. And I said, well, it's free and you don't have to register. And then she got really excited and she started writing things down. And she says, this is so liberating. And I said, you know, I've been in this industry for 30 years. Nobody's ever used the word liberating. And she said she thought that this information was only available to the older guys in the back of the room. And I, I suspect, I didn't clarify, but I suspect she was thinking about, you know, spec editing software or subscription-based services. Um, a lot of younger architects are put, you know, they're not to told this when they're in school, but when they get out of school those first few years, they do a bit of the grunt work. They do a bit of the early, you know, short lists and uh, research on products and, and whatever else. And so um, I'm going to be down in... New Orleans on January the 4th for the AIAS uh, grassroots conference. I'll be giving a little talk down there. Um, we're trying to do a, a much more to reach out to emerging architects and younger architects uh, for that reason, you know. But anyway, Beautiful. I, I guess back to the Beautiful. point of AI. Arcad.com. Oh, oh, and secondly, we have a podcast, uh, which has proven to be quite popular. We passed the 500,000 uh, download mark uh, a couple of months ago. It's hosted by Shree Lakeside. It's called Detailed, 
And um, I think we've had about 80 episodes. Each one features a really cool project. She interviews the designers and specifiers involved with the projects and talks about the challenges that they had with the project. It's informative, it's entertaining. She does a brilliant job. Um, it's only been out for about a year and a half, and I would imagine it's one of the top rated architectural podcasts that are out there, very informative. And that is available on our cat as well. Excellent. Excellent. Glad to hear that. Thanks for telling our listeners about that. It's an excellent podcast. And Brian, thanks for joining us today on the Business of Architecture. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.